one of the first mistakes that I see people doing on LinkedIn is that they don't use it. <laughs> they don't use LinkedIn. Like it's just, you know, you're a passive user, you have a profile and, and you're just waiting for the opportunities to arrive to your inbox. That's that's totally not the way to go, right? Networking, which is basically reaching out to those recruiters and commenting on their posts and, and engaging with them. That's called networking, right? Networking should really be genuine. And, and if eventually you want to connect with those recruiters for a job or, or you know, to, to talk about whatever they do at their company, at the end of the day, you, you want to make sure that you have in mind that this is networking and it shouldn't be like I comment on their post once and I'm going to reach out to them kind of thing. It should really be something genuine, right? Do what everyone else is not doing. Become a creative job seeker and find ways in, in which people are not doing these things. And that's how you will send out. Welcome to episode 10 of Sharing Developer Stories, hosted by Tech Rally. Today, I have a special guest, Stephanie Nussi. She's the CEO and founder of MaxUp, a career consulting firm. In this episode, we will deep dive into multiple different strategies in optimizing your profile and help you land that next job. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sharing Developer Stories, hosted by Tech Rally. Today, we are changing it up, and I'm not interviewing a software engineer, but trust me, there is a reason for this. Today, I have with me Stephanie Nussi. I actually met her on Clubhouse, and she was just sharing so many gems that I knew I had to have her on. She is the CEO and founder of MaxUp, a career consulting firm, and also a incoming financial analyst at Google. I'm so excited to talk to her because she has so much information that she can really help optimize your online profile and help you get that first or your next job. So Stephanie, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be speaking to everyone watching this right now. And I'm sure that the gems that will be dropped today will help so many people. So I'm excited to get it on. Yeah, let's do it. And before I start, I usually format this show with asking a software engineer to share their story. But since this episode is a little different, of course, I still want you to share your story. But I would like to spend the majority of this time asking you questions and why it's so hard to get a job in tech and how do you stand out from the pack. So first, please give me a little intro of, about yourself. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. As um, Alex said, my name is Stephanie and I am the CEO of MaxUp. And I'll tell you a little bit about Stephanie five years, six years ago, and then the Stephanie now. So I came to the U.S. six years ago. When I came, I was only 17 years old and I came with two luggages and one dream. I wanted to uh, make sure I achieved the dream, which was to make an impact in the world one person at a time. I wanted to land my dream career. So I wanted to get an opportunity in college here, but I didn't really know how to get there. And so as a first gen, you know, proud Latina and, you know, finding my way through what I really wanted to do was not the easiest path, was not the easiest road. I got rejected a lot of times. I, my lack of English, for those of you who don't know, I came here and I didn't speak English. So I know there's a lot of people out there who also struggle to kind of like develop that learning English skill. And it's not easy, especially someone who do not speak the language at all. So my first year here, I got rejected from the colleges I applied to. And then going from there, I had to learn English in a year to be able to enroll in college uh, when I was 18. And so I was grateful to get a university that wanted to take me in in 2016. And ever since, it's been more and more challenges. So, you know, you would think that after the first rejection or, or challenge, you will be done and like, you know, it's all happiness, but it wasn't the case. Um, I kept getting rejected from the companies I applied to. Um, and I, I, I thought to myself, what is I'm doing wrong? Like, what is I should be doing differently? And so after I found my way to my dream companies, I was able to realize that there were a lot of things that, you know, college students and professionals didn't really know about recruitment and how to really strategize to get into their dream roles. And that is why I started my own company when I was 19 and two years ago, because I really wanted to give and provide those resources. And there's a word that people use when they call me, which is resourceful. But then I didn't have the ways to give people those resources. And that's why I started my own company to help people maximize their potentials and also like land their dream careers while losing those non-traditional strategies. Because we all know that there's ways that general general ways to get into a dream role, but there are ways in which you can just strategize and get there on a more easier way. Right, right. So that makes total sense. And I think it's just really amazing because you only figured it out after you got rejected and rejected. And some 
most people, they don't know why they get rejected and they just constantly do the same thing over and over and over again. So at what point did you realize that, oh, I want to help other people learn the same strategies that I did and then kind of wanted to start this kind of company called uh, MaxUp? Absolutely. So uh, it was two years ago. It was, I remember like it was yesterday. It was three days after New Year's. I was sitting down and planning my goals for a year. You know, sometimes when you start a new year, you want to do something different, get your goals together. And I said, well, I want to get to a specific goal, but I want to help people to get there with me. And so I was listening to a podcast and there was uh, someone talking about, hey, you, yes, you, why aren't you doing what you're supposed to do? And believe it or not, I thought they were talking to me. And I said, that's true. Like, I've been doing this whole professional development and helping people get their resumes done and interviews all this time since I ever, you know, started college, but I never really thought about doing it professionally, never really thought about doing it to to a point where I could help masses, right? And so I kept doubting myself and this is called imposter syndrome. I thought I was not good enough. I thought that I didn't really have any value to add. And so six months after that, I spoke with my mentor. We talked about it. We talked about my business idea. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make it happen. I want to maximize people's potentials. And that's where the name came up, Max Up. And so I want to do it and I want to do it for real. And I put myself, I changed my mindset. And I started thinking about what are some of the ways that I can help these targeted specific people, which by that time were college students and eventually developing to be more professionals. And so I started going to different events, traveling to different states and doing so many different things to help people. And so I found so many gaps between talented students and, you know, companies that were looking for talent. And I said, I want to be able to bridge that gap and sort of help people to to those companies to get the talent and the talent to find the opportunities. And that's when I really like opened my mind in 2019 and I said, I want to I want to make a change in the world. And if that means that I need to do something like having a side hustle and keep helping people, then I'm going to make it happen. And um, at that point, I started traveling and and then all of a sudden, you know, COVID-19 hits and it not only hit for like job seekers. Right. It also did for me as a as someone who had a business and I was helping people get a job. And then all of a sudden the job market, it just crashed. There was no jobs nothing and people were you know it, it's a lot going on in social media and so um for me it was that moment when i realized like thank god that i started my company before COVID hits because i knew that people were looking and seeking for that help that i wanted to provide and at that point was my moment of realization saying that was a good idea that I started what I'm doing because people need it. It's just that we didn't know that people needed it. And we didn't know to what extent because that's the point. Like we know people need something, but you don't know until you see something like a global pandemic of how much people really need that career development push. And so at that moment was when I realized I need to keep doing this. I need to keep helping people maximize their potentials. And what what did you have to change differently? Because I think in the beginning you said you're traveling a lot, going to... Like, uh, maybe colleges and maybe doing some, uh, um, what do you call it, speaking engagements there. But now that everything went virtual, obviously, we've just seen a lot of people, even on Clubhouse, they're all looking for different roles, whether it's product managers, software engineers, anything to, well, I'm just generally in like a lot of the tech rooms, but in general, everybody's kind of like looking for a job. So what did you have to change differently with kind of your approach to helping uh, job seekers find jobs? Yeah, so I think like one of the first things was basically adjusting myself to that new life that I was living. And what I mean by that is I was not used to traveling that much. I was not used to be speaking to hundreds of people, right? And as I said at the beginning, I'm not an English speaker. I just learned English three, four years ago. And so speaking to a lot of people, talking about what they needed to do to land their own careers, so was putting myself out of my comfort zone. And so um, I had to change a lot of habits. I have to become more self-disciplined to be able to provide what job seekers were really looking for. And so that was in my side, but also I had to become a leader because having a company means having people who help you get there. So I developed my team last year and fun stuff. 
a lot of them are college students. And so they look up to me as a leader, as someone who can help them get to that, the, that next level in their careers. And so not only did I have to be there and show up for the people that were the job seekers, right, but also the people that were working with me and my team. And so as a person and all the interpersonal skills, besides like all the hard skills that you need to learn as a business owner, it's just like that moment where you really need to think about how can you help your team and the people that are with you to get to that next point. And so now that you're, you were talking about Clubhouse as well, you know, we have to adjust right now. I have adjusted to be using Clubhouse literally like hours, hours and hours a day, keeping helping those job seekers because unfortunately we can't travel now, right? We can't really be going to colleges in person and having things that I had before. So now I'm adjusting to be doing this in Clubhouse and keep helping people all day, every day. So I think it's just really a matter of the mind that you use to adjust to different things. And I can tell you that adjustment, it's so important. If you're a job seeker right now and you're watching this, I can assure you that you will need to adjust to a whole new environment when you're starting a full-time job, and, you know, the corporate world and everything that you're doing. And I think you alluded to this uh, before, but you said you're trying to help uh, solve the disconnect between companies hiring and job seekers. What do you think is the major gap between the people that are trying to hire and people looking for jobs? That's the $1 million question. <laughs> and the reason why I said that is because it's, it's, it's so many different factors. I think there's not really like that one major, but it's like a lot of different factors that contribute to this huge gap. But I can tell you one of them really is where companies look into or, or where they look and versus where candidates, in this case, job seekers see those opportunities, right? Because, you know, a, a general typical job seeker would go online and apply for a company, right? And then companies would go to a specific colleges to to hire for, for those candidates and those top talents that they're looking into. And so, you know, for that reason, there are a lot of like students and, and also like recent graduates who basically don't have the alumni or they don't have the network or they don't have um, you know, those companies coming into their schools to hire. And so they have to go out of their way to find new strategies to see whether or not they can get hired. And then on the other side is companies who, you know, they don't really know what talent it's out there. And so they have a specific schools that they look into. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like that gap where like companies don't see the talent sometimes. And then it's the other side of the job seekers where job seekers don't really know how to approach it if they don't have the opportunities in front of them. And so that's why I kind of wanted to bring perspectives to job seekers like, hey, if the company does, doesn't go to your school or if you don't have alumni or network at that company, then create the opportunity and make it happen. Do whatever it needs to be done to make sure you show up and the company knows and the recruiter knows your name and that you can get that opportunity. And I feel like that's one of the major gaps. Like how do how do we connect this talent people who have the skills, but, you know, don't have the opportunity to put their skills in front of those companies? And how do we get the companies to see them? Right. That makes total sense. And uh, let me just give you a scenario because a lot of my audience in my YouTube channel, they're generally either coding bootcamp grads or self-taught developers. And having that kind of alumni community may not actually exist. So say I am a self-taught software engineer that's been coding for about six months. What are some minimum things I need to do to stand out? I know you mentioned like a social presence and whatnot, but what are those things? If I had to just like maybe d dive a little bit deeper, can you give me some tangible things that I, I can do as a six month self-taught engineer? Yes, absolutely. So one of the first things I would say in New Touch on it, which was the social, I think um, a lot of the times we don't pay that much attention on LinkedIn. And I think LinkedIn is one of the best platforms for, for job seekers and specifically self-taught professionals, right? And so what I would do if I was a self-taught developer would be this. You probably have so many projects that you work on. You have, you know, if you're, if you're a web developer, you have websites that you work on. If you're a software developer, you know, you have different projects that you work on. You have a GitHub project um, portfolio. You have all these different things. What I would do is I would utilize LinkedIn for those different portfolios and show it to the people that are basically the people that can hire you. And this is how I would do it. There's different, this is, this is a new strategy that I just discovered, by the way. So this is kind of like new sauce on LinkedIn. But there is a, there is a, a way to connect with these professionals on LinkedIn and show them what you, what, what, what portfolios and projects you work on. So if you go on LinkedIn and you look up, let's say, software engineers on the search toolbar and you find groups, 
you're going to find at least 10 to 15 groups that are software engineers. Now, the beauty of this is some of this group have over 200,000 people. If you join one of those groups and you have your portfolio ready in hand, LinkedIn allow you to message every single person in that group for free. So, you know, if you're a LinkedIn account, you have to connect with someone and wait for that person to reply to you. And who knows when that's going to happen. But if you want to connect with someone and say, hey, we belong to the same group. I just saw that you're part of the software engineering group here on LinkedIn. And I'm actually a self-taught developer. I have my GitHub portfolio and I would love your recommendation or feedback on my portfolio. You're not asking them to hire you. You're just looking for feedback. And the beauty of that is like you're getting feedback from people who are professionals in the area. Right. And that's a First thing, the, num- the second thing is you never know. That person might say, hey, actually, your skills seem pretty solid. I would love to have a talk with you and see maybe, you know, I can I can have find you a job here in my company. You never know because the, the point is putting yourself out there. Right. And and trust me, this is the minimum that I'm talking about. Right. Putting putting your projects out there because a set of developer. Right. You might not have the background or, or the degree or the alumni, but you can you know, show them what you got and and what skills you've been working on the past few weeks by getting those those projects in front of those hiring managers and the people that can actually give you a job. That makes total sense. I I totally didn't even know that that it actually existed. So thank you for sharing that. And actually, my question was going to be, what's your opinion about LinkedIn? Is it necessary or super necessary? But (laughs) obviously, I think you've already answered that question. But I just had a curious a question is again regarding LinkedIn. What do you think are some pitfalls and common mistakes people make on LinkedIn? Yes, I think one of the first mistakes that I see people doing on LinkedIn is that they don't use it. <laughs> they don't use LinkedIn. Like it's just, you know, you're a passive user, you have a profile and and you're just waiting for the opportunities to arrive to your inbox. That's that's totally not the way to go, right? So if you have a LinkedIn and you're not using it right now, number one, the very first thing you need to do is edit or fix your LinkedIn profile, right? So if you're a software developer or self-taught engineer, just for an example here, I will have a cover page on my LinkedIn saying all the skills that I have. On my about section, I would have all the skills tech stack that you have, you know, Java, Python, whatever programming languages, you know, I would have all that on on my profile. And the next thing that I would do is that I will make sure that I comment and engage with those recruiters that are posting those jobs every day. Because you literally, if you search up hiring on LinkedIn, you'll see recruiters posting jobs every single day. There's literally jobs being posted every single day. And so it's not about you just going and, and commenting like, hey, hire me, right? Is you commenting something thoughtful to that recruiter? And then you're going to go ahead, message that person and send them your, your portfolio, right? It, it, the beauty of LinkedIn is that you have so many people commenting jobs and so many people posting it out there, but we are so scared to go and reach out to that person and show them our projects or whatever we work on. And another mistake that I see commonly in people that they do is that they focus a lot on just the profile section, but not the content creation. If you're a self taught developer and you have experience in, in a lot of the tech part of it, and I'm just bringing this as an example, you are an expert on something that a lot of people on LinkedIn don't know. I know nothing about Python or how to code. So if you can create content on LinkedIn about things that you know and you became an expert on, guess what? I'm going to get interested in your content and chances are you're going to get discovered even faster by recruiters are looking for talents like you. So using LinkedIn, number one, so changing that to what you should do is Use LinkedIn more often, become an active user, you know, comment on, on, the, on the recruiters. And the second thing is make sure your LinkedIn profile really, really is tailored to what you want to do. Because why would you put on your profile that, you know, you you are an analyst or something like that where you're looking into getting into a software engineer role? You know, you want to make sure you're discovered for the right things. So make sure your LinkedIn is tailored and make sure you engage with content and you are actively using the platform. Just to dive a little bit deeper on this, say that I'm a very new user to LinkedIn. So my social network or my network in general, I don't really know too many recruiters. I don't know that, you know, Stephanie helps people with landing their jobs and their careers. Do you, are you recommending that on the search engine that I type hiring or recruiters and then I'll get this list of potential recruiters or like what's the best way to find recruiters essentially? 
absolutely great question. So I'll tell you the first best way, and then I'll tell you the second one. So the way that I, I, that I talked to you recently was the second one. I'll tell you the first one. The first one is get Clubhouse. So get the Clubhouse app. And make sure you are on those tech rooms that we host every week. Because honestly, there is these rooms that I'm talking about for anyone who doesn't know what Clubhouse is, it's basically an app with a bunch of rooms and there's a bunch of recruiters who go there and they literally pitch their roles. And so I've been on, on, on this on this room. So there's 30 plus recruiters from all the fan, the big tech and like all these companies hiring. And they're literally telling candidates, like, if you have the skills that I just mentioned, literally send me your resume right now. And people get jobs out of that, right? So if you didn't know how to get recruiters, just know that recruiters are in Clubhouse right now. And they're hosting rooms every single day, right? So make sure you get on, on onto those recruiters. That's the first way, I would say. And then the second way, which is more of, you know, getting a little bit more in the non-traditional strategy and is the, the LinkedIn part. So... There's two types of recruiters. There is the active and non-active, meaning passive. So sometimes I'm sure you hear that before. Oh, I messaged a recruiter and they never got back to me. I never heard from them before. You know, I don't know what to do. What's next? So I did what I did what you asked, but I never got a response back. Well, do you check if that recruiter is really active on LinkedIn? Because chances are that maybe the message that you sent or number two, there might not be active on LinkedIn. So the way to know if a recruiter is active on LinkedIn or not, maybe go on the hiring. So hashtag hiring on the search toolbar, see which recruiters are posting those jobs. Those recruiters posting jobs most likely could also be creating content on LinkedIn. Look for recruiters creating content on LinkedIn. There's definitely a lot of hashtags like job seekers, hiring, recruiters, tech, all these hashtags are being used by recruiters. You want to make sure you connect with those that are creating content as well. I think a lot of job seekers are missing out on going on recruiters content and actually leaving thoughtful comments there because I can tell you, I actually got two offers on LinkedIn, thanks to LinkedIn. And it was because the content, because I've been creating content since 2019 and recruiters have been noticing me because of the content that I put out there. And I'm not an expert, but that's not to say that whatever I have to say, there's someone out there who's going to benefit from it. So if you have imposter syndrome and you ever consider creating content, but you don't really know how to go about it, just know that there's someone out there that's waiting to listen to that. So just to summarize, number one, get on Clubhouse. Number two is find those active recruiters posting jobs and creating content. So if you didn't know how to find the recruiters, now you know. That's such good advice. And to be honest, I even made a video about Clubhouse and why you should be on Clubhouse because it's one of those apps where, you know, nothing is recorded. And every time I hear all these recruiters talking about these job positions, which I'm not technically interested in because I'm already working, I, I'm just like, man, I wish I could just grab 60 developers here and just shove them in this room and be like, are you interested in this job? Are you interested in this job? It just, it feels like it goes into a hat and then disappears. It's kind of like this magic trick. And I'm, I'm just, oh, uh, I really want people to get on it because all the recruiters are just listing out all these jobs. And uh, yeah, it, but th that's really good advice, number one. And I think the second one is also good as well. And I think one thing I wanted to talk about is actually a lot of recommendations that software developers give other software developers is make content but none of them ever say make content on LinkedIn. They always say make a blog post on Medium or Dev.2 or just very developer-focused websites. But it just seems like you're killing two birds with one stone when you're able to just kind of copy and literally paste it over onto the LinkedIn. And so why not do it? So that's another really, really good advice. I just have one question about commenting on recruiters' content as well. Do you, is it better to comment and then on multiple, I guess, content articles and then eventually try to connect with them? Or is it better to kind of, are you like, is it better to have a slow play on this or is it okay to just connect with a recruiter or like make that requ request right away? Yes, that's a great question. And I think it really depends on how quickly do you want the results? Because the, the, there are two points to, to mention here. Networking, which is basically reaching out to those recruiters and commenting on their posts and, and engaging with them. That's called networking, right? Networking should really be genuine. And, and if, if eventually you want to connect with those recruiters for a job or, or you know, to, to talk about whatever they do at their company, 
at the end of the day, you, you want to make sure that you have in mind that this is networking and it shouldn't be like I comment on their post once and I'm going to reach out to them kind of thing. It should really be something genuine, right? Um, so I feel like if you really want to stand out, I would start first by commenting on some of their posts, like twice, three times, four times, like, you know, I continue engaging that way, make them like, make them see you first, make them recognize you first. And then once you see that they're engaging with your comments, that they're really liking your comments, then I would take the step further and like, you know, kind of like send them something that I want to send them. Maybe that it might be my project, maybe whatever the case may be. Like I would take it in the networking way first and then try to get something because imagine if I tell someone, hey, go comment on a recruiter's post and then go send them a message with your resume. It's kind of like, it's it, it's just in such a sectional, right? And, and I just feel like it's it should really be something genuine where you, you connect with the recruiter first um, and then you kind of like want to make sure that you continue that relationship with the follow-ups. Um, that's another thing that I was going to get into the, the, the next phase now, which is follow-up, right? Um, follow-up goes a long way, even with comments. Like we're not telling you here, go and comment on someone's post once and then that's it, forget about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's about like really follow up and I'll give you everyone watching this a strategy to how to do an effective follow up. If you're going to be commenting on those recruiters post, I know a lot of times you're being told about following up with messages, but have you ever been told about following up with comments? If you were not told this before, I'll tell you how. Go work on a spreadsheet. If you're a coder, is there any other way that you can find it easier? By all means, go for it. But I would say, I would say go and put together a spreadsheet and put 5, 10, 15 recruiters who you're consistently, consistently engaging with their, com with their content on LinkedIn. And then what you're going to do is you're going to put a specific date. I would just put the date, literally like this day, this day, this day on which you left thoughtful comments with them. Now, once you know that, then you will know, like, you're, I don't know, you're, you're, you're got, something will tell you, like, this is the right time to reach out to them now to get to the next level. Because if you comment on someone's post once and then you forever forget about it because you're not going to remember everyone you commented on, right? You can ask right. that. But if you have that, that tracker that will tell you about it, it's the same thing as following up with messages. Why are we just doing once when we can do two of them? And if you want to just say kill two birds in one stone, right? What you can do is this. Have one sheet for the messages, one sheet for the comments, right? Follow up with the comments, follow up with the messages. I promise you something will happen. I don't know what, but something will happen. So kill two birds in one stone. From my perspective, what it sounds like you're pre uh, kind of I said preaching, but uh, like kind of trying to hammer down is the the art of consistency, right? You keep it's it's not about just this one big swing and hoping that it'll hit, but it's actually commenting once. Maybe that's like, and if I'm alluding, like making a reference to baseball, it's like, oh, you go to first base and then like you hit a double and then a triple. It's and then eventually you'll hit a home run where you establish that connection with that recruiter, and then maybe you could kind of get the ball rolling with potential job opportunities. I think I already know what the answer is here, but I've heard a lot of mixed reviews re on Clubhouse actually from different recruiters about cold messaging or cold emailing. In your opinion, what do you think is the best way to kind of approach that LinkedIn messaging? Because I've heard some recruiters just say, just tell me the job description ID and what you're interested in and give me your portfolio and that's good enough for me because I'm so busy. I can't like really establish that kind of relationship. Maybe they're, they're more of the passive recruiters in some ways, but I'll be curious about what your opinion is about that. Yeah, you know, I've heard it a lot as well. And I would tell you the following. I think it also has a lot to do with like you as a job seeker doing your homework. And what I mean by that is that a lot of these recruiters are telling you about, you know, tell me the job ID and whatnot. Usually, majority of the time, they have that on their about section on LinkedIn. They say, hey, if you're interested in a role, you know, message me or email me with the job ID and whatnot. So if you know that that's what they're looking for, I would stick to that, right? I would try to like approach it that way. But Generally, generally speaking, like I always recommend people to just do a genuine call message, right? Like you're interested in knowing the recruiter, you're interested in getting maybe an informational interview with the recruiter, right? And so I feel like it really depends on like how the recruiter manages that part with their messages and how you, how well are you doing your homework on like finding out like what the best way to approach that recruiter would be. But generally speaking, I would recommend a job seeker to really be genuine about the cold email. Like, 
you know, like instead of just sending the resume right away, like, hey, saying hi me, like I'm not a recruiter and I get those messages. That's why I say it. it's not even because I've just heard it before. It's like I get those messages of here's my resume, hire me but I don't know you kind of thing, right? Or here's my resume, refer me to your company, but like they don't know you, right? And so I just feel like it should really be about like, get that person to know you if you're looking for a referral. Like that person's literally putting their names in in, in, in the stake here. And so like, you want to make sure that you you, you get to know them a little bit. Um, That's how I do it. And I'll tell you one last thing. When I was a job seeker, this is what I did. Um, When I was reaching out to recruiters, I would see their post about like, hey, I'm hiring for this role. And what I would do is that I would generally, not because I wanted something out of it, I would generally message them and I would say, hey, I saw that you posted this role on your LinkedIn profile and I actually have a huge community who perfectly aligns for those skills that you're looking for. I would love to share that job with my community. Would you mind if I do that? And they will love that I do that because they don't have access to the talent that I have access to, right? And so what I would do next is maybe, you know, have them email me about those jobs and give me the, 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 all the, the details. And I will message that to everyone who I know and other groups that I was part in. And next thing you know, the next day I will get messages from those same recruiters saying, hey, thank you so much for sharing. I got 100 new applications. I got 30 new applications. I got this and that. And honestly... That's how I started building up friendships with recruiters, not even like just relations, friendships, because it was something genuine. I just wanted to help. And you never know, like I always say, like networking is really an exchange of value. So it's really about like not just like what they can do for you, but how you can help them. You never know. Right. So I would just say, like, know or look for ways in which you can maybe add value to them, because at the end of the day, you also want to have them on your network eventually, even if you get the job or if you don't get the job. That's a super good point. And one of the things that I like to emphasize, even with my people that I coach, is you can't just expect someone to be your mentor. It's like, hey, can you be my mentor? Like, uh, we live in a society where everyone's so easy to take, 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 but they don't they don't actually want to provide the value as well on the other end. So to really, really stand out, you got to kind of do something like, hey, how can I help you? And then they'll recognize, oh, Stephanie helped me get 100 people to apply for this role. This is awesome. I really want to help her because she helped me. It's like, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours mindset. And I really, really agree with that uh, that mindset. And But I know you did mention resumes and just shoving resumes. I had a really maybe a hot take question for you. What do you think about resumes longer than one page? Should they be longer than one page or should they be only one page? Great question. So here's my take on that. If you are a college student who have not graduated, you're still in college looking for internships, I'm sure you probably have also college students watching this one page resume, right? Um, keep it to one page if you're a college student. And I would even go ahead and say, if you have less than one year of experience, if you just started your new job, you know, you have one, maybe two years of experience. I'll try to keep it to one year because, again, I don't know how many internships you did throughout your college experience. I don't know how many experience you have. Once you graduate, your college experience is start to become a little bit less and less value valuable to the to, to company. So I'll try to keep it to one page. But if you're someone who has like 10 years of experience, you're a senior level professional and you have five, seven years of experience. I'm sure you wouldn't be able to put all of that in one page, right? So two pages is good. I would just say, again, like for a college student or if you don't have that much experience, don't extend your resume to two pages just because you want to fit in everything and maybe whatever you're fitting in doesn't really fit the role. I would say like it really depends on how how, may, how much experience you really have. College students, generally speaking, one page. If you have more than four or five years of experience, two pages. And, you know, it really depends on the experience you have. So that would be my take there. Um, because I wouldn't be able to tell a 10, 10 years, you know, 15 years or like five years senior professional, hey, put your resume and, you know, your experiences in one page. It would be kind of like almost impossible, right? So that would be my take there. Got it. And speaking of resumes and applying to jobs, I think we've kind of alluded to this when the importance of networking and whatnot. But what's your opinion about the realistic XR? I guess, outcome of actually getting an interview if you just go on a company's job portal, apply that way versus trying to do it some other way through LinkedIn and messaging the recruiter and kind of giving the resume to them directly. I think that there are different ways to be a job seeker and there are different ways to get that job. 
Now, there's not a right or wrong way to do it, right? What it, what there is is that there's more effective and maybe they're just the general way to do it. So what I recommend, because I have a lot of clients and I have a lot of, you know, they ask me the same question, like, do you recommend I only apply online? And I say, don't just apply online. Never don't, never just apply online. Do something else, right? So what I mean by that is, Generally speaking, you would apply online. You have to, right? You have to put your information. You have to apply online. That's that's just that's just given. But what I would say is before you apply online, after you apply, during the application, do all the things that will benefit. It's like think about it like let me see what analogy I could give. Um, I don't know. Let's say we're growing at three, right? Let's just put that in in perspective. And we're just putting water. That's a, that, that's a general, that's a given, that's the way to do it. But what if I tell you that there are other things that you can do for that tree to grow on a faster way or a more healthy way or whatever the case may be? That's the same way I would see in application. Applying online is just one way, but there are many other ways, like, as you said, right? Reaching out to the recruiter or finding the hiring manager on LinkedIn, you know, connecting with a recruiter, getting a referral from an employee from the company and things like that, that can literally just add a little bit more and more and more and more to that application so that you can get that first round interview. Now, you know, talking about the interviews is a whole nother topic in which there's a whole lot of things that you, you can do, right? But to get at least to the first phone, phone screen to that first, you know, interview stage, I would say don't just apply online. But try to find other ways in which you can get your name, just get your name, at least to the recruiter who is hiring for that role. Let them see that you really have the value. Let them see the, to at least give you the chance for a first round interview. Because think about it. Any company and a big companies, big, really big companies get thousands of applications, thousands. And you have to think about it this way. You can have a perfect GPA or, you know, you can have great experience, but there are other people who also have great experience, who also have a great GPA. So now you're competing with who knows how many people who have the same experience than you. Now, how, what are you going to do to make sure you stand out from everyone else? Do what everyone else is not doing. Become a creative job seeker and find ways in, in which people are not doing these things. And that's how you will stand out. I really love that term creative job seeker. It's you, of course, the bare minimum is necessary, but what you, else are you doing to make sure you stand out is super important. And a lot of right now, I'm emphasizing a lot of my questions around how do you stand out? How do you get that first interview? Because a lot of people I talk to generally, that's the biggest problem. They're like, once I get that interview, I know I could do well, but trying to stand out is so hard because it's, I don't even think it's about effort. It's just you don't really know how to do it. So a lot of the information you're giving today is just so valuable but potentially if there are those people that can stand out easily and i know maybe we're a little short on time but if you could kind of give me a, a short rundown of some interview pitfalls and what interviews do's and don'ts can you share that with us absolutely so i'll tell you the following interviews are different and so you will treat them differently what i mean by that is the approach you take to prepare for a behavioral interview should not be the approach you take for a technical interview. Like, let's say if you have to have a whiteboard and start writing different problems or algorithm that you're being given for whatever interview it is, you're not going to study and prepare for that the same way you're going to study for a tell me about, tell me about yourself or, or in a behavioral um, interview question. And so what I would say is taking it from that approach, then you would know how many hours you need to, to prepare for that one how many people you need to speak to for that and so on and so forth. So what I would tell you is the following. Do the work before you apply. And you're, you're, everyone watching is like, well, what do you mean? Well, I'm telling you this today. Don't apply and wait for getting an interview and then have a week to prepare and then start preparing for the interview. I would say connect with employees from the company that have similar roles or roles that you want to get into. Try to get them to do mock interviews with you. Do as many mock interviews as possible. I, I'm telling you, do as many as you can before you apply. Once you apply and you get that interview, what's going to happen is that, hey, I already did 70% of the work. I already did the mock interviews. I already did whatever, whatever. And now I just need to practice and reinforce whatever I was just practicing in, right? And I feel like most of the times, that's what really kills people. Interviews, the fact that they don't have enough time to prepare. 
right? And so if you do the work before you actually apply, what well, chances you're going to get that opportunity to get that all out to you. Another, another side of the story, let's say you didn't get the chance to do the work before. You have a week to prepare. I would use some time to network and some time to prepare. What do I mean by network? Well, you know, a lot of people don't really consider how important it is to get to know people from the team or people that work at that role, right? Um, Because when you're in that interview, you want to make, oh, yes. So I spoke with X, Y, and Z person that's doing X, Y, and Z role. And, you know, I really love to learn or know more about what you guys do here. I actually went and looked at the project that you're developing now, um, you know, the $95 billion project that you're working in now. And I would love to see how that's developed and if I can even get a chance to work on that when I get into the, my first day here. And even so, if I do get, you know, this role, I was actually working on, you know, what I would do on the first 30, 60 days and 60 and 90 days of my job. And then, I, you know, I, and, and you would have your notes there and I would say, oh, you know, like I, I would really, really love to continue working with the developers to build up this and this and this. And I think like something that would really benefit this would do this. And they're going to look at you like, man, what? Like, you're already thinking, like, you already work here. Like, you're telling me exactly what you're going to do on the first day, on the first 30 days. It's, it's kind of like the higher manager who was interviewing is like, what? You know, and, 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 and I think candidates don't really think about that that way when they're, like, you know, going over that interview mentality. Speak to the interviewer as if you were already an employee of the company. You're going to tell them, like, this is what I bring to the table. These are the skills and this is what I would do now. A, 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 some of the don'ts that I would say just quickly is number one, don't make your negative connotations after something that's negative. And what I mean by that is people really kill their chances when they talk about their background or things that they have. Like they say a self-taught developer, right? You were talking about them at the beginning. Why would a self-taught developer bring that experience as a something negative? Although I'm a self-taught developer and I don't have a degree in computer science, I, you know, I think I can do this. No, you shouldn't say that's not the language, right? You should say, I am, you know, I have a different background and I decided to go into computer science or software engineering because I love technology. I'm a self-taught developer who did this and that. I studied for this amount of hours. I did this amount of boot camps, da 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 and the list goes on. Now you're, t- yeah, now you're talking to me, to the interviewer, as someone who like did whatever or did the impossible to get to where you are right now. And you're not using your background or something negative, right? And the last dawn that I would say is, if you start an interview with this high level note, don't leave it on this note, right? So like when you ask th- those questions at the end of the interview, like don't ask like those simple questions or things like th- that, you know, that, that, that you just kill yourself. You did so much work throughout the entire interview. And then at the end, it's just like, it just ends right here. What do you think the interviewer is going to remember the most about you? It's the last five minutes of the interview. I promise you, they're going to remember the entire interview for sure. But the last five minutes, that's what's going to remember the most. You want to make sure you really, really stand out on that part. There's so much to unpack there, but oh my gosh, that's such good information. And a lot of the stuff that I is in my head and I kind of say it in a different way, but I totally agree with you. I think the first thing is nothing beats preparation. So you have to be prepared. And a lot of, at least people in my industry, software engineering, we value a lot of the technical aspects, but we don't prepare enough on the sharing your story, sharing what you actually did at your last company. Sometimes when you work at a company for too long, you don't remember everything that you did. And that's kind of one of my pitfalls that I had when I started interviewing again was I was, I felt technically sound. But there were times where I had to share some stories where there's like conflict resolution and whatnot. And I was kind of more in the negative aspect because I was just being a little too honest about certain things. But it's always good to try to find that positive spin, even in, even in a negative situation. But I wasn't prepared to share those kind of stories because, like I said, nothing beats preparation. So really, really good, uh, good advice. And I think a lot of people will find value from it. So we talked about LinkedIn. We talked about networking. We talked about interviews. I kind of want to leave it open to you. Am I missing anything else? Like, is there anything else we could we need to talk about? I think there's one thing that I would want to leave everyone watching this right now would be uh, the following. We're living in a virtual world and, um, you know, we don't know when things are going to get back to normal. We don't know when those networking events, career first, those things in person will happen. 
What I would say, though, it's utilize what's been trending right now, what a lot of people are using and successful, and those are LinkedIn and Clubhouse. It's literally so crazy right now that job seekers are getting jobs out of just staying 30 minutes in a room on Clubhouse. It's it's really that crazy. What took you like three, five, six months, so probably taking 30 minutes of your time, just, you know, logging into that Clubhouse room. And the next thing is, you know, make sure that you represent your brand well online because we are online right and so whatever that means to you whether it be getting those certifications to put on your linkedin whether it be to just talk to people to just like um refresh and those communication skills because now that we're in a virtual world and we're kind of like always in front of the camera you know making sure that the way you portray yourself and that brand you know make sure whatever you need to do to refresh those things that you do it because i do think that We talk about the entire process of job seekers right now and and getting a job, but branding and like the way you portray yourself, it's way much more than just getting a role because you get a role today and then next thing you know, you need another role or you want to leave your company and guess what's going to help you, your network and your brand. So I would say like, besides focusing on job seeking and, and, you know, getting that job in the role, also focus on developing that brand to the point that when you're when you're literally out of your career or on you know when you want to transition careers, you know that you have a network to go into. You know a diversified network that you can talk to, and you know that you can continue developing that because I feel like we don't put that much attention, especially when we get that role, when we get that dream job, we forget about like the network and everyone that we should be meeting. And then when we have to change or shift our careers to just get something new. We have to start from zero and you never want to be in a position where you have years of experience. And then next thing you know, you have to start from zero building that network. Never do that. It can be fixed quickly. Just continue doing what you're doing. And I promise you 2021, you'll get the one. Yes. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I was going to end this with a closing theme. Maybe you could kind of give a little bit more insight about some strategies you might use. But for you, I wanted to ask. A lot of people, it's not about a matter of effort. It's about working smart. What have you found the best way to kind of execute on your goals? Absolutely. So I would tell you the best way that I found about executing my goals have been getting to know myself more. Once I've gotten to a point where I really know who I am, what I bring to the table, and I have become at someone who I know companies will want then I'll take it to the next level, which is building up strategies that work for me. And the the next thing is constructing my diet content. And what I mean by that is we put so much effort, and as you say, effort into something that sometimes we forget about what we consume can also affect us in the way that we strategize our goals and whatever plans we have. So I would say as much energy as you put into getting into all these things, make sure you have a diet in how much you consume. Take things with a grain of salt, strategize and look for ways that work for you. And if you try something and it didn't work for you, don't give up on the first try. Because I personally have used so many different strategies. I felt on so many, but that didn't stop me to keep going to continue constructing what I really want to do. I can tell you many different plans that I've worked in, in the past before um, in which I failed and I didn't know why did I fail. And then the thing is that I used to think that everyone else's strategies will work on me and that's not the truth. The truth is I can build up and construct my own strategies, but I need to know myself and I need to know what really works for me in the way I am. So get to know yourself. Make sure you build up those plans, build different circles. So what I mean by that, and this is the last thing I would would leave everyone with is sometimes we think that the people that we're surrounded with are not helping us or the people that we're surrounding ourselves is not really that circle or the support that we need to persist them. I would tell you this. Don't walk away from different circles. So you never know what that person can do for you in the future. But make sure you have different circles and different support systems that you can go to when you have different goals. So one goal can have one circle and different goals can have multiple circles and multiple support systems. So line on different people, but never forget that the people that you might not see value on today can be people that can help you in the future. Man, <laughs> you're, you're spitting so much knowledge. And in some ways, I would say even our relationship right now is a true testament of what you just kind of talked about is I'm not really a job seeker. I'm not looking for like specific career advice, but I know that the people on Clubhouse have so much knowledge that 
I want to help with my audience. And I realized that I don't know everything. I'm not a junior developer. I'm, not, I'm just coming from a perspective of a senior developer. And I want to make sure a lot of the advice that I do give is coming from people that I'm getting advice from, right? So I found Clubhouse really valuable because of people like you, because of people like in those Clubhouse rooms. So I just, I just am so happy that we met and you're able to share so much information with my group. And hopefully, you know, we could kind of always build on this relationship. But yeah, if anyone of my audience, if they want to contact you, what would be the best way? And do you want to share any social links, maybe even some max up references as well? Yes, absolutely. So if anyone wants to connect with me, they can find me as my name, Stephanie Nuesi. I'm sure you're going to put it in the description too. So literally every single social media, it's just my name, Stephanie Nuesi, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, you know, TikTok, uh, Clubhouse. Make sure you get on Clubhouse. And I am in a lot of those rooms that I talk about with those recruiters. So make sure you join me whenever you see me on Clubhouse because you're going to see a lot of value being added there, which I actually have a Clubhouse room right after this. Um, so everyone, make sure you um, find me in those social media. And, um, you know, if you guys need resources, I have tons of free resources for job seekers. They can find it on my website, on my pages as well. If literally all you need to do is show up because the information, the resources and the advice is there. So show up, take it, and I'll leave everyone with this. Get on your A game because you're going to get that one yes in 2021. Thanks for having me, Alex. This was super fun, Stephanie, and I really, really appreciate your time. I really believe my audience will find a lot of value. So for everyone else, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.